Welcome everybody to the 6-5 Summit. We are so excited to have you here today. My name is Daniel Newman. I'm the founding partner and principal analyst at Future and Research, and I will be your co-host. And I'm Patrick Moorhead, founder, president, and principal analyst at More Insights and Strategy, and I'm your other co-host. I am super excited, Daniel, about this jam-packed agenda that we have. Yeah, we're going to start off with a warm welcome and introduction from none other than Michael Dell. And then we're going to have a one-on-one -on -one with AMD President and CEO Lisa Su to talk about digital transformation and innovation in the enterprise. Yeah, and then it's going to come back over to me for a conversation uh, that I'm going to have with Doug Merritt, the CEO of Splunk. And we're going to talk about data and the role it's going to have on our future. And then we're going to get back together again, uh, do a wrap for day one, and then talk about the remainder of the 6-5 Summit and the agenda. So without further ado, let's send it over to Michael Dell. Hi, everyone. I'm honored to kick off this year's inaugural 6-5 Summit. 2020 has already brought a whirlwind of unexpected events and one of the most rapid transformations in business that we've ever seen. The detrimental impact of the global pandemic on the economy and jobs has been heart-wrenching. But there's another story about the incredible number of businesses that have been able to stay up and running because of technology. We found new ways to gather, to meet, and to conduct business in a world that is seemingly digitally transformed overnight. What would have taken months or decades is now happening all at once. This is an enormous opportunity for the tech industry to step up and take an even greater leadership role to support our collective future. From next wave technologies like 5G and AI to important discussions on healthcare, diversity and sustainability, we are positioned to lead the charge to be a catalyst for a better world where technology keeps us more secure, more connected, and more informed. The world is not going to slow down. These last few months have accelerated us to a future where technology is the backbone of the new normal. The 6-5 Summit focuses not just on the products and services of the tech industry, but also on the vision of technology and how we can harness its power to help businesses be more successful and to make the world a better place. Dan and Pat, I'll turn it back over to you. I have to say, I always love to hear from Michael Dell. Yeah, it's just terrific to get someone with so much experience to share their perspective during these times we're in. Well, and speaking, for, speaking of experience, our next speaker up is AMD CEO, Lisa Su. Yeah, I have to say, when I heard Lisa was joining us at the 6-5 Summit, I was thrilled. It's been incredible to watch the revitalization of AMD since Lisa took the helm. So let's run over and watch my interview with Lisa Sue. Hi, Lisa. Welcome to the 6-5 Summit and helping us officially open the show. I really do appreciate you joining us today. Hey, Pat. It's great to be here with you. Um, I'm really happy that uh, you and Daniel are having this and uh, really looking forward to it. Thanks. And I know it, it'd probably be better to do this face-to-face, uh, -face, but we all know what's going on and that's just not uh, a possibility. So let's let's dive in. Uh, so digital transformation, you know, I, I love this buzzword. It's, it's been here for about five years. I'm curious, uh, you have a lot of interaction uh, with enterprise uh, customers and partners. Uh, what are you hearing from them right now? You know, Pat, um, I think none of us would have expected that 2020 um, is what it is. And, um, you know, the fact that, you know, we have had, you know, this unprecedented time and, and everything going on. Um, I will say that um, it, it's really been um, really interesting um, as we uh, spend time with customers and, and partners. What you find is people are really now understanding how core digital transformation is to the business. You know, it, it, it is um, it is essential to everything that we do. And um, it gives you a real appreciation of the technology that we're working on and what we can do with it. And whether it's work from home or schooling from home, or it's, uh, you know, how do you connect? I mean, frankly, I connect with more customers now than I did, um, you know, last year, just because I, I've cut out all that travel. And, uh, you know, it's become acceptable for us to do, uh, you know, video chats and, and uh, conversation. So I, I think the, the fact is digital transformation is here to stay. I mean, the pandemic will come and go, um, but the, um, the abilities that we have, the efficiencies that we gain, the uh, capabilities 
um, that brought in are, are what makes it so, so important um, to, uh, to everyone, really. Yeah, it's incredible. Uh, and it's really on, on, on three sides. Uh, you have the manufacturers making rapid changes, uh, hardware, software, and services. Uh, you have um, the customers, uh, the end users who, who had to get used to this as well. And then uh, you had IT and the businesses all having to move at the same time. It, it, it's been incredible. Uh, so I think uh, we all have personal examples. Uh, we, we talked a little bit about this before of how to pivot from working, learning, and I like to add governing uh, from home uh, has, has caused a huge shifts uh, in, in behavior. Not all of them easy. Uh, I'm curious, what are your thoughts on, on those that are, are fleeting, let's say in the here and now, and, and those that stick uh, after, let's say, we found a vaccine and, and people are comfortable and, and safe to go out? What, what is the new normal? Yeah, so look, I've been um, incredibly impressed at what, you know, frankly, all of us have been able to do. I mean, if I just take, you know, AMD, for example, we have about, you know, 12,000 people and we pivoted, you know, like many of our, you know, tech peers to work from home for about 90 plus percent of our workforce in, you know, like a minute. And, um, you know, the fact is um, the products are still getting built and, you know, we're, we're making tremendous progress on the roadmap. Um, you know, we're spending a lot of time with customers. We're spending a lot of time with partners. And I think that's that's true for for um, a lot of tech. You know, we've, we've really been able to move very, very quickly to um, let's call it the current normal. Um, yeah. Now, you know, that being said, Pat, I'm a I'm a big fan of. Um, you know, in-person activities. I like uh, seeing people. I like spending time with people. Um, I, I think there is a desire, um, you know, for us to return to more of a balance. So yeah, we may not travel as much as we did in the past, but um, I'd love to see you in person, you know, and, and we're probably like, whatever, five miles away from each other, but we're doing it uh, on, on video. And um, and I think what it, it um, has put a premium on is the relationships and trust that you have built, you know, over time, because, um, you know, in this sense, uh, we are all truly in it together. I mean, I can't tell you, um, you know, how many um, how many new relationships as CEOs that we've built. Um, there are lots of opportunities for us to get together, whether it's on Zoom calls or Microsoft Teams or or WebEx. Um, but there's a lot of opportunities for us to come together and really, you know, solve some of the larger um, you know, systemic uh, issues. And so, you know, one of the things that I like to think about is the better normal. So, you know, we, we keep talking about the new normal. Let's talk about the better normal, which has uh, perhaps, you know, a little bit more balance um, than, uh, than we had, um, you know, a year ago. I 100% agree with the assessment. And it's funny, early on, I really was thinking personally that, you know, this new normal meant we're just not going to be getting on airplanes. And then over time, the amount of time not actually seeing people face to face and the the strain on relationships, either building them or improving them, reality hit. And I agree with you. Uh, I think there's going to be just more flexibility here, a little bit more of a blend. If you look at governments who really never govern from home, that, that's the biggest difference I think more employees will get uh, uh, choices, but uh, I appreciate those comments. So I'd like to shift to high performance computing, really been in the limelight lately, if nothing else, uh, for scientific and, and medical reasons, either looking for a cure uh, or, or helping uh, uh, people get better. But high performance computing is more than just for uh, medical research. Uh, it's it's really very valuable to CIOs uh, as well. Uh, many of those who are on this call today, can you talk a little bit uh, about the applicability of high performance computing for them? Yeah, absolutely. So you know, high performance computing is you know sort of our mantra at uh, at AMD. It's all about how do we push the envelope of what computing can do for you. And you know, at the very, very high end, it, it is these supercomputers uh, that are being used to, uh, to help with COVID-19 research or you know, a whole bunch of you know, other things. But you know, when, you, when you take the technology that you develop for high-performance computing, that's you know, high-performance processors and the interconnects and all of that stuff, um, what you're able to do is uh, you know, really address 
um, a whole number of workloads. And, um, you know, again, from the very, you know, complex, um, you know, simulation, you know, based workloads, whether it's for finance or for, um, you know, for research um, to, you know, now, um, and, you know, Pat, I know you and I have talked about this a lot, you know, this whole hybrid world that's existing. So the idea that, um, you know, many businesses will have both um, their on-prem um, computing as well as what they can do, um, you know, uh, in the cloud and, you know, the, the cloud variety that you have now um, that's optimized for different workloads, um, you know, allows you to do, you know, a whole bunch of different things. So I think the main point is um, one would be surprised at how much uh, computing has has changed and how much we can do now. Um, you know, I can tell you, even in our own case, um, we were very much an on-prem uh, type uh, company, you know, you know, thinking that, hey, right. when we're doing our products, we want to do everything in-house. But, um, you know, the, the cloud environment has proven to be very, very flexible for for us and, and for many of our customers. Yeah, it is interesting. Uh, and I'm sure you've seen this over the last 30 years. It always seems this, uh, you know, we're looking for the killer app uh, and then we find it and then we're, we, we question the value of hardware. And uh, we hit things like uh, machine learning and big data analytics. Uh, I haven't heard anybody uh, ask why I need all this performance for about five years. And I think that's that's great for the industry, uh, but I think it's great for enterprise outcomes as well because we're just smarter. And it's not just the highest end elite enterprises; it's it's everybody. It's it's been democratized and. I have to give you a lot of kudos, uh, Lisa, for democratizing for so many people high performance uh, computing. Well, I, I appreciate that, uh, Pat. I think we all we've all done a, a big part in it. But the the most interesting thing, I think, to your point is not only are people saying, "What am I?" Not, you know, they're not asking, "What are you going to use performance for?" They're actually saying, "I need more." And 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 it's you know, it's, it, you mentioned you know, machine learning and and big data analytics. I I, I think. You know, the, the feeling is we're still at the very infancy of what we can do, you know, with those technologies and, and we're all learning, you know, in the process. Yeah, there's just going to be a ton of opportunity for everybody out there. And, and speaking about the future, let, let's pivot to the future here as, as a second. As, as the CEO uh, of a major semiconductor company, uh, you have to make bets uh, on a three to five, actually architecturally, probably on a seven year basis. Uh, but you're also uh, filling fabs, which have these massive capital uh, ex expenditures with your partners. Uh, what advice would you give to IT leaders uh, about uh, navigating the uncertainty uh, of our current situation? Yeah, that's a great point. Um, you know, I think, you know, all of us have have thought, you know, a lot about, you know, short term versus long term. Um, I will say, though, fundamentally for all of us in tech and spe specifically, you know, when you're thinking about, you know, what you're trying to accomplish over the next, um, you know, three to five years, um, we must think at the foundational level, you know, fundamental level of what do you need? What problems are you trying to solve? Um, how do we affect those, you know, with our partners? Like for us, it's about, you know, you know, how do we really stay above the performance curve so that, you know, we're giving people more uh, performance per dollar uh, with um, with each generation. And, and those are things that, you know, are not temporal. Um, you, you know, you, you don't optimize over the next month or two. You really make decisions on, hey, what's the next node process technology? Um, what's the next node architecture? Um, who are the partners that you want to partner with and develop a long-term roadmap? I, I think that's those things are really key. And and the uh, the fact is, the closer we work together, you know, in different disciplines, so silicon systems, um, you know, software and user. Um, the better we're going to be able to affect those outcomes. And, and so I'm a big fan of deep, deep partnerships, you know, talking about, hey, what problems are you trying to solve if you're in the financial industry or if you're, um, you know, trying to solve a, um, a, a difficult technical problem? And, and, and we can think about how we can help you solve those with um, innovations in, in silicon and systems. I think those are very uh, sage words of advice, uh, Lisa. And, and I think uh, it, with an incremental level of credibility, uh, as I've watched you lead AMD uh, over the past few years and uh, super impressed. I mean, it's you've been on a meteoric uh, rise uh, on, on all fronts. And, and with that said, 
What advice would you give uh, other leaders of companies looking to drive the highest degree of excellence uh, from their organizations uh, or large teams? Well, you know, Pat, um, first of all, thank you for those kind words. Those are very nice. Um, but uh, what I would say is um, it, it really is about um, a journey. You know, we, yeah. we've been on a journey uh, for um, the last five years. You know, we're, we're looking at our next journey for the next five years. Um, it is um, about consistency in what we say to our customers and what we what we commit and what we deliver. Um, and then it, it, it's about having a great team, right? A team that um, that really is extraordinarily ambitious in um, in what you're trying to accomplish, um, but we're able to operationalize it. And and that's that's sort of how I view it, right? Um, you know, as we as we build these um, relationships with um, you know some of the the largest IT providers in the world. Um, it is about bringing consistency and bringing, you know, our best game um, every single day. Uh, I've been following AMD for 30 years. Uh, I've interacted a lot uh, with, I think, four CEOs uh, at, at, at AMD. And, and Lisa, what I'm really struck by has been the consistency of your strategy. If I go back to, uh, many years ago to your financial analyst day, and I look at what your objectives were and what you wanted to do and your strategy of how you wanted to do it, it's remarkably consistent. And sure, you made a few tactical pivots along the way, which is just smart, uh, a smart business, but uh, there's a lot of value to that, uh, of getting your team aligned, uh, your partners trust you more because you do exactly uh, what you say you're gonna do. And I think finally, uh, what I really appreciated, because in my heart, I'm a product person too, is let's deliver great uh, products. Oh, that, that's absolutely right. We wake up every day thinking about that, Pat. And um, like I said, we're very lucky uh, that we're in this market that is just tremendously exciting. And, um, you know, sort of the, the, the core of what we need to do with uh, digital transformation. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, whenever I, whenever I hear people say uh, software is eating the world, uh, uh, not, I don't correct them, but but I say, well, actually, hardware is eating the world too. You still uh, need hardware, all right. As a exactly. as software is, you still need hardware. So exactly. So with that, Lisa, uh, we're coming up on time, but I just want to thank you so much for making the Six Five Summit uh, even uh, better and. Um, Next year, we, we'd love to have you on. Uh, but for now, uh, this is Pat Moorhead from More Insights and Strategy uh, signing off with Lisa Sue, uh, President and CEO of AMD. Thank you so much, Pat. Great to be here. Wow, what a great discussion. Lisa Sue and her team at AMD aren't only focused on products and services from AMD themselves, but really focused on driving innovation that's going to impact the future and the way we work. Yeah, I totally agree, Daniel. And hearing how Lisa enabled digital transformation and innovation in new ways for the enterprise, I thought was really compelling. Absolutely. So let's pivot over to our final segment. Let's do it. Next up, I'm thrilled to be joined by Doug Merritt, President and CEO of Splunk. Doug Merritt, welcome to the 6.5 Summit. How are you doing today? Good, Daniel. How are you? I'm doing great, Doug. I, uh, I'm sitting in my studio and I'm at home. I, I did actually travel recently for the first time in four months, but you look like you are traveling because I've done this with you a few times in the past and I've seen what your office looks like and that does not look like your office. Uh, so, so where are you? We got bold as a family and uh, a week and a half, two weeks ago, uh, came down to Cabo San Lucas in Mexico. That's it, beautiful. Uh, it's beautiful down here. It's beautiful down here. And it's, uh, they, they take COVID seriously. So masks, uh, the hand sanitizer, temperature checks, uh, it, it's, a, it's, it's a good, effective environment. Yeah, you know, I think getting anywhere you want to go is probably the riskiest part. Uh, if you can get somewhere, because you can kind of quarantine anywhere. It, you know, so if you as a family are able to follow all the restrictions, uh, I don't see any reason that that's really a big problem, but uh, I really appreciate you taking the time. 
obviously we love having you as part of our, our keynote general session here at our very first six five summit doug i've had the pleasure of talking to you a few times you look a little more relaxed i think <laughs> i don't think there's any way you can't be but i'm i know you well enough to know there's no way uh that you are not working even though you are in cabo san lucas yeah it's a it's a, it's a weird paradox because i'm up at seven and on video conferences, usually until 5 or 6 p.m., while the family is having an awesome time and I get to look out the window and, and have, watch the fun. But it's still, it's better to be on video conferences in Cabo than it is just about anywhere else. So. Absolutely. Well, again, you know, really excited to have you here. Uh, as an analyst, I've had the chance to really enjoy learning a lot about the journey of Splunk, but for our audience here, I, I, I kind of want to start in the beginning a little bit. You know, in this session, we want to talk about the future of work. We want to talk about building culture and stability and, and data and leadership. But uh, I think for a CEO to really be able to share those points, it's always great to, to go back a little bit to the beginning. Um, and I'd love to hear a little bit about your run as uh, at Splunk so far and just a little bit about how the company has changed uh, since you joined. It's been a really, uh, obviously, a fantastic journey that I'm just so thrilled to be on. Um, I've been with Splunk for almost six and a half years, uh, and it has changed dramatically, and it hasn't changed in some ways, too, which is kind of a cool paradox. Um, when I came on board, we had just finished a little bit over $300 million in revenue, um, and last year we closed at $2.4 billion. Uh, we were under 1,000 employees. We're over 6,000 now. Um, we're now in, so we, we, we have sales in over 100 countries, so a much bigger company. Um, but what I like about Splunk is the core of the culture and the attitude and the orientation still, to me, feels very, very similar. Um, the way it was described during my interview cycle was, we are a builder-doer culture, we're kind of blue collar. We roll up our sleeves. We are so excited to get stuff done. We'd rather undercommit and overdeliver. Um, low politics, you know, people are, are honest and forthright, and I believe that's still the case with Splunk. And I think that culture has been one of the foundations that has enabled this ridiculous amount of growth and huge product expansion and massive business transformation to actually happen. Uh, and and it happened well, and still I, I retain our identity and and a lot of our camaraderie and closeness. Yeah, it, it's interesting you, you point all that out. Uh, I've been to your offices, I've spent some time, and I'll say the company never feels as big as it is, which I always think is an is a indicator of a, of a warm culture. And, you know, we uh, work with a lot of great companies. And so the feeling when I've been on campus, and obviously that's been a <laughs> while now for even you, um, was always very, very much that way. And I always enjoyed all the snacks, by the way, the the top floor with the 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 beer and the the uh, all the just the great end of day snacks in the game room. Um, yeah. You know that's that's very San Francisco, very uh, very Valley ish. But uh, I, I can see what you meant. But I also just while you're talking about change, you also you know elicited a lot of meaningful change. Even recently, though, you're, you mentioned the business model changes. You mentioned the way people consume. Um, open source, uh, going from being more proprietary to open source. Can you just touch on that a little bit? Because I think those have been sweeping changes and have really been more like the last one or two years, those have become really out in the in the front. Yeah, we we started this whole series of changes. It actually is part of my interview cycle as a CEO, so which was almost exactly five years ago. So the idea of where we were, where we needed to go, I think has been pretty clear for a while. Um, and, and we have stayed pretty consistent on what change was necessary also, but it is a high volume. We've moved to from really a singular product that was on-prem, stateful and vertical scale out, our indexing and searching capability to a cloud-based portfolio of products um, with a much more clear platform set of portfolios that complement indexing with stream processing, with orchestration, automation, collaboration, uh, heavy emphasis on machine learning, whole new consumption paradigms uh, from uh, virtual reality to augmented reality to mobile connected experiences, uh, continued development with our solutions around security, IT, app dev. Um, but that 
expansion hasn't just been an expansion on a technical front and getting us to a cloud footprint, but that comes with a whole business model shift. Uh, we've gone from upfront revenue to ratable revenue. Um, and through that, we've had to completely change our go-to-market motions, our pricing, and the way that we actually convey value to customers from data volume-based to infrastructure and value-based. Um, so a, amazing, amazing amount of change. More change than, uh, than, than I could have conceived would be able to actually keep focused and execute through. Uh, and it's one of the things I'm so proud of our amazing employee and, and board and customer population to, to go through and to support. Yeah, there must be a lot of great advisory, Doug. I think I was looking the other day on Yahoo Finance and, and uh, the market cap of the company was north of 30 billion. And for a company that you often have to tell people or they go, what is Splunk or who, who are Splunk? Or, it's, it's like you realize this is a company that's now as large as some of the biggest tech companies in the world. And so you should be really proud of, of, of those results. And, and it's really been at, at, at sort of the uh, in a response to data's rapid proliferation. Um, you know, I, I said data has kind of become the North Star for business. Uh, and Splunk, you find yourself as an organization at the center of this discussion. So, you know, I'd love to hear from you. How has the use of data changed the way that you lead and that you build the business at Splunk? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And it's, it, things like market cap are interesting because you're never as good as the market cap says. You're never as bad, right? They, they go up and down, they're out of your control. But the fun, fundamentals of what we do, that, that is important, important. That's lasting. Um, and and we are we have been at the forefront of the big data movement um, back before people even knew to call it big data. Um, and I think we continue. One of the things I'm really proud of with Splunk um, before getting into how we use data and, and uh, the thoughts around data um, is our willingness to push the boundaries um, beyond what we are comfortable with and already know. Going back to you know, indexing was really, really important in search being able to lean forward with stream-based processing, uh, streaming machine learning, integrating a whole host of open source componentry from Kafka to Pulsar to Flink to Spark uh, to Kubernetes, you know, that, that willingness to um, look outside through a customer lens and try and, and really stay close to what are the important use cases and value that a customer looks for, and then come back to, now what do we have to do to get that done? Um, and the usual response would be double down on what you know and do so well. And while we continue to, I think, double down and improve the kernel of what Splunk was, um, we also have been very open to expanding across that data landscape. So whether it's data in motion, data at rest, data stored in other systems, um, or a whole host of different algorithmic capability to drive higher value through the platform or through, this, through the solutions, um, data, from our customers, data from the industry uh, has been our primary focus to, to make sure that we're progressing the fundamentals of the company in the right direction. Yeah, and, and, and what we've been through in 2020, which in January there were some fires and we thought that would be the hallmark of our year. <laughs> and boy, did, uh, did uh, that not end up being uh, the biggest moment. But the pandemic, and you can't really have a conversation and not talk about it. It's still in parts of the world, including here in the US, a really big topic that doesn't seem to be going anywhere anytime soon. But your your story, I had the chance to talk to you about this, serves as a really great example of using data to drive and inform your own decisions. Because if I recall, you basically had about a, what, two or three day window at most to decide how you were going to run your business when the uh, San Francisco uh, in that whole area kind of came to a grinding halt? Uh, I think we, we reacted pretty quickly in the Northern California uh, shutdown, the California shutdown, but um, we, we've got such a talented group of folks across Splunk and um, our facilities and risk management and government affairs teams have been hard at work from well, the end of December to early January given our footprint in China, in Japan, in Australia, in Singapore, and Korea, um, working with the pandemic and trying to get a view of what was happening with the pandemic. And we'd had to shut down uh, many of our Asian offices before we even had an inkling that was gonna happen in America. So the willingness to um, turn to data 
see what, what, what was the data saying uh, across Asia on what was appropriate for the safety of our employees and what were the government, governmental policies and how do we you know, very rapidly understand the location of all the employees and the health of the, all the employees. We'd had a few um, iterations and practice sessions that when it came to a bigger chunk of our employee population, you know, 50, 50-ish, 50 50-ish percent in the U.S., um, we were able to act very quickly. It still was a lot of heroics um, across the entire spectrum, HR facilities, the IT team. Um, you know, while we've all been uh, able to work just about anywhere, making sure that everybody works now remotely, like for every other company, you know, the ability to spin up VPNs on a massive basis to expand our cloud footprint and our apps footprint um, was uh, a really fascinating thing to watch the IT team actually turn to Splunk so quickly and actually develop a set of solutions that how many customers are using uh, to help accelerate remote work uh, all the way down to uh, being able to ping and understand the quality of Teams or Zoom or WebEx sessions, uh, as well as the health of VPN and, and on both the security basis and an overall resiliency basis. Um, so, so data definitely helped us a lot in going through the iterations, being crisp in decision making. It's still what we're turning to um, in every single office around the world uh, to try and, and guide ourselves on what is the right set of decisions and protocols in a really, really dynamic situation. Yeah, and, I, and I bet when we look back in history on this, we're going to see a big differentiation in companies that acted and responded with data and companies that didn't uh, in terms of the outcomes. And it's early days because as much as we like to think we're seeing the outcomes, we're still in the very beginning. It's We have, it could be, I mean, this hasn't died down yet. So we could have another six quarters, eight quarters, uh, maybe even more where this is still going to have a very uh, lasting and, and material impact on business. Um, so you mentioned a couple of things that actually kind of takes me where I wanted to go though, because you kind of talked about, you know, I mentioned San Francisco and California, but you're a very global company, like most of the companies involved here in the 6.5 Summit. And so while even your ability to react and respond to a market, uh, the data had to enable you to react and respond to many markets and um, yeah. make decisions for a company about how to continue to act local and think global. Um, you know, I'm hearing more and more about some return to work in other parts of the world where this virus has, has subsided more successfully than it has here, um, which means new sets of data, new sets of decisions. Um, and, you know, culture, which is kind of where we started, um, is a driving force. Uh, it's going to be a driving force in your business's success. And of course, going remote, the team all got together, made it work, um, has, has continued to sell and grow and and hit numbers and drive that market cap that's either too good or not good enough. But now you got to think about culture because a lot of the power that built you to where you were, um, for a short period of time, people can react and, and, and live in, in uncomfortable and different environments. But what ends up happening is over time, it starts to, it can have a, a drag coefficient on your business and your operations. And so whether you bring people back at some point in different geographies or just one example of, of, of this, but you've got to be making some key decisions about how to change the culture to sustain whatever the artifacts are of COVID and the pandemic, while concurrently, um, you know, being able to double down on the stuff that, that made the company grow and succeed and, and have all those successes that you talked about at the beginning of this conversation. Um, so I, I made a lot of points there, I realized, but you know, how do you make decisions now to decide what do we go back to? What do we not go back to? Um, and how do we make this, this, company continue to have this special ingredients that got us to where we, we are? Yeah, I, mean, I, I think first order principles are so important in framing any type of decision. Um, and one of the first order principles that we continue to guide ourselves around is we have to, we, we've got a strong belief in the competence, capability, uh, intelligence uh, of our employee population. Um, so we, while we continue to look at data around the world, and I agree with you, I actually think that we'll be adjusting and continuing to iterate on how to live with this virus for much longer than people predict. Um, even if we wind up with some type of vaccine, viruses mutate, there's gonna be a constant readjustment, readjustment. So how to live with the virus, I think is a much more important set of conversations than how to 
kill or stop or extinguish the virus. I think that that, that cat is likely out of the bag. Um, you know, when I look at things like case count, that's an interesting metric. Is that the right metric? Is the right metric, how do we ensure that hospitals are able to deal with caseload? How do we have a deep understanding of mortality and who to protect and how to effectively protect them? So constant data, I think, is going to be beyond, has been critical and be beyond critical in helping us live with this virus. Now, but within the Splunk context, there are very different policies around the world. Australia has got a different situation than Japan does, which has a different situation than Germany, than Sweden, than Denmark, than France, than US, than Canada, than Mexico. And we've got people in all those different locations. So it is a difficult problem of making sure that we stay on top of the constantly shifting legislation, policy, uh, the artifacts of data around the health and capability um, and safety within those different regions. And the grounding principle for us is let's make sure that we expose that information that, that we adhere to local approaches and support local governments, but then expose that information to our employee population and trust our employees. We don't know what the situation is across 6,000 employees for every single one of them, and we shouldn't know. Um, we can give them information. If I think about the foundations of, of, data, of data, there's four principles that we evangelize, transparency, openness, collaboration, and diversity of data. Um, and if you take that approach with the employee population, and make sure that they're informed and that they're able to make effective decisions and you adhere to the local um, policies. Now, now I think for us, at least we got a more winning combination. People that are informed and feel comfortable coming to an office, they should be able to go to the office. People that have that same information are not comfortable and have different situations, they should be able to, to work from home. Um, and yeah, that extends to our partners, to our customers, because it is an ecosystem and it's not just Splunk employees we have to worry about. We got to work, think about the, the broader broader landscape. But um, I think having first order principles on data, having first order principles on culture and how you make decisions um, is always uh, a good place to start to make sure that there's consistency for the people around you in how they should be reacting and how, how the comfort in how you react and how they react and how the interaction actually works or doesn't work between the two. Yeah, and, and and I love that. And you sort of almost trickled into what I was going to ask you last. And we only have a couple minutes, so maybe I can just get you to to provide a little extra context to this question. But you know, you talked about the lasting impact that the pandemic is going to have on business. Um, stability is actually probably the next big step for driving the industry and and enterprises forward. Uh, you know, growth is a great thing to think about, and some companies can think about that now, but stabilizing the environments, creating, bringing the culture back, getting back to innovation in this sort of post-pandemic, uh, it's not really post, this ongoing pandemic world, you know, you got to balance, and I think it's three things. I think it's data, I think it's innovation, and I think it's culture. And so if I could just have you touch on this, um, one final question before I let you get back to uh, your trip. Um, <laughs> How do you approach these three things and maybe balance them with both humanity and technology? Yeah, I, I mean, I think the really interesting part for all of us is we're not going back. This whole concept of, and you can see it in the different political landscapes around the world, the way to go back to what we're comfortable with, uh, from everything we can tell, time has one direction. So you got to figure out how do you move forward. Uh, and I think there's so many opportunities through this pandemic and through the continuation of this pandemic for new ways to make sure that you're able to get gather data, new ways to make sure that you can continue to innovate and collaborate and have a strong network of people, and new ways to continue to build culture. Um, this morning, we have been going through a whole series of exercises, first with executive staff, and, and now we're starting to across the company on where do we see the culture today and where do we see it going? And we had one of those, you know, really cool, typical, hey, let's get together as an exec staff and review where we are and talk about our individual styles. And those are always in-person sessions. I, I, we had a really successful uh, virtual session where we reviewed, we, we were very intimate, we reviewed our own personal styles, we reviewed the culture of the executive staff, how that was likely to reflect on the culture of the company. And that is a totally different way of... Uh, looking at data, of thinking through innovation to continue to drive the company forward and evaluating and enhancing and doubling down different parts of the culture. But it actually worked in a virtual scenario extremely well. 
Um, so I think we will all keep inventing ways to move ourselves forward, our families, our communities, our countries, and our companies um, in the face of very different interaction patterns than we once relied on pre-February or pre-December if you're, if you're in China. Yeah, no, I, I really appreciate it, Doug. It's, a, it's the human in the loop of uh, data and leadership. And I know that's an AI term, but I mean, this is a, a, a geeky uh, event. I hope, I hope we have lots of tech lovers out there that enjoy that kind of uh, terminology. But what I mean is it's really taking the best of empathy, empathic leadership. It's using all the data and it's, it's, it's applying it. It's applying it across your business. I, I do truly believe that the winners and losers will be defined by the companies that are able to employ data most successfully, utilizing the most useful data while concurrently never forgetting that behind all that data and every single number are people. Um, and empathy is going to matter a lot in terms of driving the future. Doug Merritt, CEO of Splunk, I want to thank you one more time for joining me here at the Six Five Summit. Daniel, thank you so much for having me on and uh, look forward to future continued collaborations with you and the team. Thanks, Doug. Well, Daniel, that really was a great conversation. It's been incredible following uh, Splunk and their journey to enable their customers to take advantage of the biggest data out there. Yeah, AI, big data, ML analytics, these are really important topics and companies finding a way to extract as much value as possible from their data. It's it's an imperative. Yeah, absolutely. You're, you're right, Daniel. So that wraps up our first opening session of the 6.5 Summit. But really, Pat, it's just the beginning. That's right, because tomorrow we're going to be bringing 30 videos live. We're going to have product sessions. We're going to have keynotes, and we're going to have spotlight sessions. And here's the thing. If you can't arrive as your calendar aligns, you can watch the videos whenever you want. Yeah, so please join us tomorrow back here at the 6.5 Summit with so many thought leaders, so many great topics. We, sh we are sure there are going to be interesting segments that you are going to want to capture. I can't wait to see you tomorrow. But with this, we've got to call it a day. Bye now.